I don't think, oh, this is a man who's going to rip the throat out of an enemy. Because whoever you're playing, he's your guy. You have to play him with a hundred percent belief. Hello, this is Frank Langello, and this is the timeline of my career. God help us all. The Immoralist in 1963 was considered hot stuff. Not much was done about homosexuality in those days. It was based on a book by André Gide, and the Frenchman Michel that I played went to a foreign land where he took one look at a young Arab boy and fell in love. That was like uh, big time. The raciest line from that play was at the end of the second act where he and his wife were in a tiny little room. He looked at her and said, I am what you think I am. We had lines around the block for the first three months you couldn't get in. Every gay man in New York came to see it and we ran for two years. Yeah, tell me, uh, what goes on in this great house? Mostly dying. I had done a play with Mel's wife, Anne Bancroft, and Mel was casting that movie and he wanted to do it with English actors. In the middle of this casting, he said, oh, it. let Frankie do it. That's how I got my first part in the movie. It's kind of like a hand-me-down. And I was the kid. I have nothing but great fond memories of the insanity of it and the idea that these enormous amounts of Yugoslavians were being directed by Mel in English and they couldn't understand a word he said. They never laughed at any of his jokes. He wasn't easy and I was a new kid and, and therefore emotional about everything. And he would say, oh, for God's sake, just do it, you know. Dom was breathtakingly funny in life as well as he was on camera. I fell once trying to pick up Ron Moody and I cut a big hole in my rear end and they put me into bed and Dom came to my room dressed as a nurse and said, how do you do? I'm Nurse Deloise. I'm here to tend your wounds. <laughs> It was a wonderful, joyous way to start your film career. Need a hand, mon père. Oh, come on, God! How old are you? 28, 29? It's none of your business. Easy, baby, easy. You know, you're in terrible shape. Diary of a Mad Housewife, my second movie, which actually opened first. I never do well in those kind of straightforward parts. I'm a character actor. I always like to find elements of somebody that was different and unique and original. It was a wonderfully written script based on a wonderful book. And of course, that film was also inordinately well received. It was a great one-two punch for a young actor who'd never been in the movies. It's a terrible thing to say about a lady. Oh, screw off, Pocahontas. I'm gonna report you to women's lib. Count Dracula. Good evening. When I read it, I thought, and you know, it's not the greatest writing in the world. It's a pot boiler. I had to find a way to do it that was totally not Bella Lugosi, I never drink wine. Once I got into rehearsal, I hadn't realized how frightened I was, truly almost frozen with fear. And I couldn't come up with a way to play him, and I didn't want to fall into the trap. So I just spoke the lines like that, very, very simply and directly, terrifying the producers. And we had a dress rehearsal, and suddenly he arrived. The idea of him being a beautifully well-spoken, gothic hero. In my mind, he was a hero because all he needed to live was blood and he needed to get it from beautiful women. It was like being Elvis Presley for a year. I couldn't go out of the theater without bodyguards and the play just struck a chord, particularly in women and in men too, because there was a great love scene at the end of the second act. And I've never met anybody who's seen that play who hasn't said to me, I got laid that night so great. It was a year of my life, a great sensational year. I doubt I'll ever have anything like that again. I didn't want to do the movie right away because the producer, he wanted it to be like the Hammer films. All of them were pressuring me enormously to have blood coming out of my mouth, to wear wolf's eyes, 
to wear fangs. I wouldn't allow them to put fangs on me. I wouldn't do any blood on my face. I just wanted to play what I believed was a lover, not a killer. You don't have much, you know, when you're an actor in a film. You don't. It's, it's all in other people's control. What you do have is control over the character you're playing, and nobody else can do it but you. And you have to risk being unpopular. I said it would be nice to see you smile. Tell me about the loneliness of good, He-Man. Is it equal to the loneliness of evil? My four-year-old son was Skeletor. We bought him all this stuff, and he'd run around the house saying, I am the power. And Gary Goddard, the, the director, called me in to meet with him, and it was a terrible script. Just awful. But I couldn't resist the the, the challenge of trying to make him real and believable. And I wanted my four-year-old, of course, to see me as Skeletor. I spent hours and hours and hours with Bud Westmore trying to get the look. And I pulled everything I could out of the man with a thousand faces. I would call Gary at two o'clock in the morning and say, look at this line I found. Tell me about the loneliness of good. Is it equal to the loneliness of evil? And we had many of those in the movie. Most of what I said was rewritten or ad-libbed on the spot. I remember Paul Newman when I asked him, what do you do if you're playing a character where the person opposite you isn't helping and the director might be giving you bad ideas or your costume doesn't fit or you don't like a piece of makeup? And he answered in four words, I play my character. And it's brilliant advice for any young actor. Don't try to make up for it. Don't try to overcome another actor. Don't try to do too much in order to make up for the fact that the dialogue isn't good. Just play your character and talk honestly. The film was not a great success, but over the years it's become a great camp movie. And many, many people over the years have said, how could you do that? You know, it's a great deal of superiority. And I would say, I think it's one of my best performances. I loved doing it. The story that will make you laugh about that is that I asked if I could have a private screening of it when it was finished. I brought my four-year-old. I gave him a big bag of popcorn. He sat next to me and I thought, oh, my son could be so proud of me. He fell asleep in the first reel. <laughs> I don't think he ever even saw me. Let this be my first decree. Those who do not pledge themselves to me shall be destroyed! We didn't want to have to tell you this, Dave. But the vice president is mentally unbalanced. I haven't seen Dave, I think maybe in, how old is it? It's 20 years old. I was in a very bad period in my career and I was doing a play in LA, which really is like you might as well be zipped up in a plastic bag and hidden under a bed. My agent called and said, Ivan Reitman wants you to come in. And I was at a terrible period, really. Kids were in schools and I was running out of money. And I went to see him and for the first time in my life, I created a power animal which a lot of my friends did. I created a lion, an imaginary lion, who sat next to me in the car. And as I was driving, I would talk to him and he'd say, don't worry, nobody's gonna get you. And he came out of the car with me in the studio. He sat right next to me to protect me. And I did the part from heart and didn't hear anything for seven weeks. And then one day my agent called crying and said, you got the part. In the third or fourth day of rehearsal, I said to Ivan, why did you make me wait for seven weeks? He said, because I went all over New York and Britain trying to find somebody who could do it better. And I couldn't find anybody. And I thought, well, that is clever of you, but awfully unkind to me. West Bank. Where... It's simple, I will. We send the vice president to Africa or something. He was my daughter. She was my child. Oh, you know, I adore children myself. And fathers. <clears throat> I love fathers. I did a film called Lolita, directed by Adrian Lyne, 
and I played Claire Quilty, one of the great, great villains of all time. That experience was an extraordinary one, but Adrian would sometimes do 35 or 40 takes. It was a scene in Lolita where I was shot and I had blood in my mouth. I was about to die and I, I had to spit the blood out in front of me and the blood didn't taste very well. I did it 39 times. It was making me sick to my stomach and I said to Adrian, what are you looking for? He said, I want the blood to spray a certain way. And I said, okay, and I just kept doing it. Get out. I was in London at the Old Vic Theater playing a horrible comedy opposite uh, Joan Collins and got no audiences in this theater of 1,700 people. We often played to 50 or 60 people. And I thought, well, I guess I'm done. And over the transom of my dressing room, like a bad movie, came a manila envelope and it was Fortune's Fool with Alan Bates. And I thought, oh God, what a great role. And that began a sort of resurgence of my career as a Broadway actor. That was a great, great success. Alan is to date my most favorite co-star and friend. He died not too long after we closed. He was suffering all during the play with pancreatic cancer and never told us. He's the most generous actor I think I've ever worked with. He used to sit in the wings in my first scene and when I would get laughs, I could see him go, yes, like that. He was terrific, terrific guy. You know, Hunter brought you here to help me, but I don't need that kind of help. You want to be partners? Let's be partners. It came after my very favorite independent film that I made several years before called Starting Out in the Evening, which if you cried at Robot and Frank, you will become inconsolable at Starting Out in the Evening. Starting Out in the Evening and Robot and Frank were shot in a period where I couldn't get a studio movie. These two glorious parts came along in independent films starting out in the evening, was financed by the director with a check from his uncle for something like $500,000. And Robot and Frank was a bigger budget, but not much. Both men in both films are breathtaking characters, beautifully written, each really in great difficulty emotionally and personally with an ex-wife, problems with their children. And that is very attractive to me, always has been. Both of those films had the luck of two directors, Andrew Wagner and Jake Schreier, who loved the material and were pure to it. Look, the library was strictly a smash and grab job. The president can decide whether it's in the best interests of the nation and then do something illegal. I'm saying that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. The last 10 years of my career have been, for me, the most exciting, starting with Nixon when I was just turning 70. I read it and I thought, I can't do this. This isn't in my uh, bag of tricks. And then I read it again. And it, it's a lesson for every young actor. I'm scared to death of this part. So therefore, I think I should do it. And I went to England and I couldn't get the character for a number of weeks. I just couldn't find him. But then I kept thinking, well, no one's going to see it. It's just being done for eight weeks at the Dunmore. It'll disappear. And I was involved in a relationship at the time. She was in New York and I was in London. I called her and I said, I suck in this part. I'm really, really terrible. And she said, oh, come on, read it to me. So from London to New York, I read her one of the big monologues and she said, you just stink. You're terrible. You're right. And then she said, what are you going to do about it? It's exactly the right thing to say. And it broke open for me. I, the next day we had a run through and I found him and he, he grew from there. I fell in love with him. As a matter of fact, Tony Hopkins came up to me the night I lost the Oscar. And he said, didn't you just love Nixon? Because he'd played him uh, a number of years ago. We both thought he was a crook. We both thought he was terribly wrong but we both fell in love with his overwhelming vulnerability and his need to hide it. But I never once played him as a villain. He was my guy. So I believed everything he did and I fought very hard to say I'm not wrong. They're wrong, I'm right. 
That's what all of the parts in general are, are sort of like. If you play them with total commitment to who the character is and not to the effect uh, he might have on others, you have a richer experience. But the lesson to young actors is, I chose from my heart, which I've always done. That resulted in eight weeks at the Dunmont, five months at the Gilbert and the West End, six months at the theater on Broadway, a Tony and an Oscar nomination. I was choosing something that I felt would challenge me in a way the other two things didn't. What'd you do? Throw in the towel, Jack. She doesn't think the world owes her happiness, which is no small accomplishment growing up in this country. I can truly say that in my lifetime, I've never talked to, had dinner with, or enjoyed a conversation with any actor who was in a long hit that was happy. Not one. They were making millions of dollars and they were in the seventh year, the eighth year, the twelfth year, and they were in misery, absolute misery. I would never put myself in that situation, never have. But I loved the Americans. I loved Matthew Reese and Kerry very much. They were the most generous stars in always welcoming everybody who came in from time to time. I would have played Gabriel another couple of seasons, but they wanted him to go home to Russia. You couldn't get tired of it because you'd be in so many episodes and you'd work for four or five very intense hours. I have done very little television, but Gabriel remains probably my favorite character on television. Wonderfully written, wonderful actress. It was a great three years. It adds up. Some of it's okay, Elizabeth. Some of it isn't, but it adds up. I think the greatest challenge of playing people like the father and Robot and Frank is having to believe in your guy and never putting your quotes around what you're doing. The fact of the matter is they think everybody is crazy. So that to play these men is difficult emotionally, but easier professionally. Dementia's, um, my brother had it, he just died recently, and he was dying at the time I was doing The Father. And the character in the play is called Andrew, and my brother's name is Andrew. And the character in the play had two daughters, and my brother had two daughters. One he favored and one he didn't. So the similarities were really, really difficult. I don't have a lot of time left, and in that time, I think I'm going to get choosier and choosier. I am now at a point where the choosiness I've always felt in my career has sort of, to a degree, it's validated me. Overruled. I am being denied Mr. right now Seale. my constitutional Will you be quiet? right for Will legal you? representation. Will you be quiet? Again, this role in the trials of the Chicago 7 came after a full year of unemployment. I didn't have anything to do. And I've always decided that when I have nothing to do, I won't do crap because that eats at you. So I wait and do other things. I write or I live my life. But Aaron called out of the blue and said, I want you to play this part. And I met him for a drink and he's just a great writer. And Judge Hoffman is a great creation. In this profession, every single one of us comes if we're around a while with a reputation. Everybody does. When you're being considered for something, the producers are going to call the last person you worked with and say, what's it like to work with Langella? And they're either going to say, great, wonderful, terrible, or he's very this or really that. We had a difficult fight about something. Aaron has a reputation for being someone deeply in love with his words as well he should be. If I could write like that, I'd take my words to bed. But he also has a reputation for you must know every word exactly as he wrote it and you must never stray from that. And he's very tight about what he wants and how he wants it. So I just decided to ignore that. And on the first or second day, I thought, I'll just take my life in my hands. And I said, could we talk a little bit about the judge's entrance? You have written this, that and that. But wouldn't it be better, I don't want to say what it was, if that happened first and then the judge, and he just stared at me 
He said, yep, yep, it's much better. If I had paid attention to being told not to be too giving of your own ideas, I wouldn't have had such a glorious experience as I did. When you get to the place where he is, now, a sort of iconic stature from the West Wing. You like to be challenged by others, and that's what I sensed in Aaron. He welcomed my thoughts and my ideas. There's something about the trial of the Chicago 7 that will never come again. 12 actors together every day for 13 days, all the time in a courtroom. We never did a shot without everybody there, plus 300 extras. So for 13 days, we were looking at each other all the time. We had such a connection, a wonderful connection. And this was truly an ensemble of actors. And I fell in love with each and every one of them. It's quite sobering to think of how long I have been doing this. It's 60 years this year. Whoever you are, viewers, I'd like to thank you for sticking with us and uh, talking about uh, my 60 years in this profession which has gone by in seconds.